Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Hasrick. Um, Dr. Hasrick is a close colleague and friend of mine. Um, we've known each other for quite some time now, for what, seven, seven years, eight years? Um, <laughs> the years are running by us. <laughs> right, they really, really are. Um, and so, um, yeah, I used to work with her on um, a large uh, multi-site um, autism intervention trial. That's how I got to know her. She also works um, down the road at Drexel University in the same center as my husband does. <laughs> um, and she does some excellent work on um, connecting folks through social networks. And so we're going to hear today about her wonderful app that, I'll hear, um, that we'll hear more about. Um, and so Dr. Hastrick is an associate professor with the Life Course Outcomes Research Program area at the AJ Drexel Autism Institute. Her work focuses on identifying ecosystems of support that, su that provide social capital for autistic people at different life stages, investigating social network interventions for autistic individuals, their families and providers in schools, districts, and community organizations, and using network data to support collaborative networks among community, educational, and service sector organizations that serve underrepresented um, autistic children, youth, and adults, and their families and communities. So we'll hear more today about um, her developing and testing the impact of a web-based social network networking app on the transition to adulthood for autistic youth. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hastrick, and take it away. Thank you, Heather, for having me here today. I'm I'm very I was so excited to learn about your group, and I am um, excited to share um, the journey of, of being someone who's uh, been part of a team to create an, this app. Um, I'm excited to kind of give you a little bit of theoretical background that led us to want to have an app and then how we tried to make that into the app and then mm -hmm. test the app and then get results from our test and uh, and share all that with you today. So, you know, like Heather said, uh, Dr. Nusky said, <laughs> we uh, do uh, ecological network stay life stages perspective work in the lab. And um, we, I'm the faculty lead of the Social Dynamics of Intervention Lab, I have many collaborators, faculty, staff, and students, and different funding sources for the work. Um, we're focused on improving quality of life um, through better understanding these ecosystem um, networks to potentially, hopefully, improve the everyday lives of, of autistic people at different stages and their families and their communities. Throughout the presentation, I will use different interchangeable terms to refer to autism, including person first language like autistic person and and um, and person first autistic per first meaning autistic person or person first meaning person on the autism spectrum spectrum. Most of my projects in the lab are um, informed by the community partner participatory research model that uh, was created by the late Dr. Loretta Jones. Um, this is where we partner with community stakeholders to create science that is directly applicable to the problems of everyday life. We are also greatly inspired and, and take a lot of um, guidance from work done by um, Christina Nicolaitis and Dora Raymaker um, from Portland State, who have developed some different ways of uh, approaching the work um, in partnership with autistic people. The larger framework here that we're looking at is these, these two different ideas about disability. There's the medical model of disability, where disability is, is sort of caused by an impairment, the individual is impaired, and the focus is on curing or lessening the effect. Um, through this approach, we learn about autistic people, but often from a deficit perspective, and intervention is primarily focused on changing autistic people to fit into society, not how society can be changed to fit them. There's this alternative model, the social model of disability that looks more at society as the problem. You know, it's an inaccessible environment that's creating these outcomes. It's discrimination, stigma, and stereotyping that's driving these outcomes. 
um, it's organizations with inflexible procedures and practices that drive these outcomes. So really here, this is about how to change society, remove these barriers, and consider neurodiversity, the neurodiversity of autistic people and focus on the self-determination. So when you start to think about, well, how do you change society? We have some big theories about that. Uh, one of our big theories is uh, well, how, how about changing larger social structures? You know, why don't we change norms, laws, policies, values, religions? Some of these things are gener they're very hard to change, but can be changed. Um, these kinds of larger social structures can create benefits and also inequality, depending on how they're configured. So we'll, when we're thinking about these larger social structures, we're often thinking about individual, how they impact individual people. But that this second question that we ask, which is how do our everyday social interactions shape society? This is the heart of our work in the lab. Like how does this networked ecological system of interactions in our everyday life come to create benefits for us and also create inequality. So networks are not necessarily better. They, they can actually transmit inequality. And, and so it's really more, uh, how do we learn enough to know how to modify these interactional settings that we all um, have in our lives? And what kind of theoretical frameworks can help us drive this work? So we take a lot of inspiration from Bronfen Brenner because you know, the target is a little intimidating. It kind of says like everything matters, but that's not really the idea here. Basically you can break up this map, this target into um, a couple different categories. So the first one is there are systems here that are really driven by social interaction. And then there are things in here that are more about social structure. So we're really trying to map that microsystem around the person and then the people that those microsystem people are connected to, well, they're in the exosystem. And you can use social network analysis to actually measure this mathematically um, if you collect the data using um, you know, traditional social network analysis approaches. So our work is looking at these microsystem connections, these exosystem connections, and then the sort of between system connections that you have. And we ask this question in our lab, you know, if each autistic person has their own networked ecosystem, how can we begin to target that and, mo and help to modify it in ways that really address that societal change, not just changing the person, but also changing the people around the person. So we use network science to measure, visualize, and modify these networked ecological systems to create benefit for autistic people. And then we came to the idea of like, well, can we use a web-based app to do this? And what would it look like? And how would it how would it work? And we took our inspiration from, you know, we were trying to think of, you know, what's something that can sort of is an image that describes this work that people do when a young adult is transitioning to adulthood. What are those scaffoldings or supports that that help them pass over like almost insurpassable terrain. Um, and we took inspiration from these trestle bridges that were built when the railroad went across across the US at multiple different structures and supports that provide a lot of redundancy and different kinds of connectivity to actually build a platform where the train can pass. So we ended up calling our app Trestle after trestle bridges. And um, next, uh, I'm going to um, move my share share um kind of what happened next to us which was um can you guys still see my screen wait hold on i might have to share a different screen here we see the trestle business plan you do okay i'm trying to make it open here but it wants to open on a different screen <laughs> hold on one second i'm just gonna um find here and share the right screen. Okay. All right, so um, we were, oh, it really doesn't like that screen, sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties, we're gonna go to here. 
All right. So we uh, we drafted a grant and sought funding to develop the app and received funding from the Coulter Foundation here at Drexel. It's a translational foundation that funds these ideas um, that you might have in your science to actually, you know, create a business product that can translate that idea into some kind of product that can be integrated into society. So we created a business plan and um, had to come up with a value up uh, with a value proposition. I don't know all of you, maybe you're all the way through this journey or somewhere along this journey, but I had many, many things to learn about what a uh, business plan looks like. I don't have MBA training and I'm not, uh, this was all like new learning for me. And um, they did provide a lot of support for us. And I, I went to NSF um, i core trainings um, too. So I don't know if those of you who are app developers participate in that NSF ecosystem where they provide these i core trainings for people, scientists who are trying to translate their work into business products. Um, but that's kind of where, where I ended up getting a lot of my training on how to do this. And, and also my team too participated in that. And, oh, I even got going here without introducing Habiba. Habiba is here with us today. And Habiba is the data analyst in my lab. Habiba, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Habiba and uh, I'm the lead data analyst at Sodi Lab. And as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, I was uh, I had the opportunity to participate in the NSF uh, last year uh, with the Tressel Lab, and uh, it was amazing. We got uh, uh, it helped uh, move forward the business plan, and we kind of got a way like how to go about it. So yeah, yeah we learned what we didn't have yet, <laughs> and how much more we needed to actually launch this thing. Um, but that would be for another presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba. Um, so here we had to explain what our critical problem was. Um, and for us, we were really focusing on this transition cliff that's been identified in the literature that um, autistic adults are having trouble securing jobs, getting transitioning to independent living situations, and these costs are high across the life course. We understand Tressel to be like a bridge between that schooling experience and then what happens next. Um, that transition cliff that youth experience is because they have these teams in, in school and there's years of relationship building that occurs. It's, it's not just that those people are teaching them how to transition to adulthood, but they're building relationships and sharing resources and creating a whole ecosystem of connection around the youth. And when they leave, all of those relationships are left behind. And then the youth is there in the transition environment um, without all those connections that they had invested so much time building and not just them, but their parents and, and all, you know, all of the other people in their family who are supporting them. So so really we were trying to create with Trestle a sort of bridge that could allow the youth to, um, with, in partnership with school people, build those relationships that would actually still continue after the transition. And then those people could be onboarded onto the app and the relationship could be sustained post-graduation. And you know maybe we could work with districts to create some way to include school school people who have been such great supporters in this post-transition work with some alternative kind of role. So could we transition them to from being teacher to being coach and like how would that work and what are the ways that we could build that that trestle bridge and could the app help us to do that? And you know what we're really aiming for here is systems change. And what I got a lot when I was going through the NSF i core was, um, well, do the low-hanging fruit. Find the, the people who have the funding and who have the need for this app and make it a private app that people can use quickly and do. And um, we have been uh, resisting that a bit because really we want to do 
the kind of work that will create an app that could be implemented in a in a system like a school district um, rather than an individualized app. One of the things that we know from app use in schools is that, that a lot of these apps are individual to teacher, right? So if a teacher is really comfortable with apps, they can pick up this app or that app and it might change what happens in their classroom. But there are few there are very few apps that are actually adopted adopted by the system itself. And, and that's where we really get that societal change that we're going for here. We don't want to just give something to some to, to groups that already have um, more resources, but we want to go in and change the way society is structured so that we can um, create resources for people who don't have them currently. And um, so we've been really thinking about and targeting urban school districts. And so um, our community-based partnership when we built this app was New York City Public Schools. And we went and forged ties with the transition specialist for their special education district in New York City and some of the other people from their uh, this, uh, assistant um, superintendent and other leaders of the New York City special education districts. Um, they became our partners in designing this app. And so rather than doing development very quickly and making something that could just be done with an individual person or buyer, we actually built a backend to the app that would allow a district to implement it so that the district, the infrastructure for implementation in a district setting is there. Um, you know, and then we also are interested in these community partners who are on the other side of the transition. And actually they're on both sides of the transition, which make them particularly valuable as partners on the app because they have some continuity potentially. And this is a particular, um, the, the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Manhattan partnered with us to help us to kind of imagine how they might be this continuous partner and how that would look and what they would need in order for this app to work for, for their needs. We also took some time to develop a like a, playbook, which we can't go into great detail about today, but we also brought together our team and then looked at the competition and tried to figure out, you know, what, what we needed to do. We pilot, we designed the app and then we pilot tested it um, with our JCC partners and shared it with our New York City partners to get their initial feedback. And then um, we used our culture funding to do what they called a killer experiment, um, with, which I would call like a quasi ex randomized control trial <laughs> um, with very minimal funding. But we did, uh, and then the COVID-19 pan <laughs> pandemic occurred. <laughs> so right as we were getting ready to launch our experiment, um, COVID happened and you know, now we are able now, some years later, we, we did finish our recruitment. We have our sample. We're, we're doing our final analysis. Today, I'm going to show you results from about half the sample because we're sort of, half, we were halfway through and now we're, we got everything else to finalize it. But today I, I will show you where we are halfway. Um, we, um, we, one of the really, bad impacts of COVID on our project was how our school district partners and our community partners were so hard hit by the pandemic that they really couldn't support us trialing an app in, in, their, in their districts during this time. I mean, I know all of us know what they were all coping with during the, the height of the pandemic, and even the recovery was very, very hard. So we had to turn to alternative means to recruit our sample. And so we really still, one of the things we really have to do with this app is really pilot test it in a district setting with district partners, which is what we're pursuing right now. Um, I've been pitching it to Philly Public Schools here and they're really excited about it and interested in the possibility. So we're just kind of negotiating what that might look like so that we could really trial it in a public school setting. Um, I'm going to give you a live demo first so that you guys can see what the app looks like, and then I'll show you results. And I just want to do a quick time check. Heather, when do you want me to wrap up?
I think if we leave like at least 10 minutes for questions, that would be great. So that would be 220. So we have 25 minutes. Okay. Good. All right. So I'll just do a quick um, demo. And I would say this is a, like a fake profile of a, of a autistic youth so that you guys can see what the app, what the app interface looks like. Um, and um, the, um, in this case, Timothy Scott, you can, when he logs on to his Trestle app, he can see his timeline that has like, um, it automatically posts when he's achieving his goals or when he's reached certain objectives that he's been working on, it posts here on his timeline. And then his team can add feedback for him. Um, there's an about where um, <clears throat> this actually came from the work that I've been doing with HRSA from ARB4, in which Ather and I are, are, are uh, collaborators. Um, one of the things that we tried to make was a passport or that we had as part of the project was this passport to help transitions between schools. And um, we had put in some information about, about the youth that they could fill in in their app to share with their team members. This is the, more the heart of the app where you have these long-term outcomes. This interface is mimics the New York City public schools transition um, report that they that they use, which they were very interested for their IEPs. They have to do a, you know, they're mandated legally required to provide a transition IEP for youth who are transitioning autistic youth who are transitioning to adulthood. These aren't their categories, actually. We started out with very clinical categories and the youth were like, oh, that's the first thing that you have to change. <laughs> but we don't like any of those categories. They're just written in very, you know, like uh, formal legalistic ways that were alienating to our youth. So we went ahead and changed it to my dream job, making every day great, exploring my community, my training and education goals. But the idea here is, you're not just trying to make one thing great when you're transitioning, but you're looking at the whole person and all the different aspects and you're setting goals. One of our big um, interests was creating it so that it was easy to edit and change. Um, we didn't want the app to be um, frozen in time like the IEPs, the individ individualized education plans that special education uh, students have they actually get updated like once a year or some, something. It's not a great way to achieve a goal to only visit it once a year. I mean, that's just really not how change happens. So we wanted to create this sort of more um, accessible, more like a living IEP that could be changed and updated as the youth wanted. Um, and then here they add their activities that they're doing to try and meet their long-term goals and um, the, this is the, the, the team, the home team, the school team, and the community team, if, if there is a community team, that can be onboarded onto the app. And the team now um, can see what the youth is prioritizing, and they can work with the youth to change or alter their priorities or um, just to partner with them to have them doing this. Um, but the youth is supposed to be in the driver's seat here. This is not meant to be a legal document where it has to have the mandated goals on it. It can have those, but the idea is that it would have other goals that the youth has or that the parent might have for the youth. And that this would be a place to have more of a comprehensive set of activities that the youth is working on. Um, so then there's also a dashboard, which at this point is pretty beginning, like kind of at beginning stages, just looking at some basic stats um, on the, the app. So that's the live demo of the app at this point. And now I want to move over to provide to show you some results. Um, I know we still have 20 minutes, so I think we're in good time here. I think we'll have lots of time for discussion. Um, so, um, we, here's the executive summary. We have, still have another 33 cases that were, that Habiba is hard at work analyzing, <laughs> but uh, we're not quite there yet. So this is to be considered preliminary. It's not the final, final analysis. Um, we got some 
pretty high support ratings, high success ratings. You know, when people were using, like from our app usability survey we gave to the youth who were on the arm of the experiment where they were using the app. Um, and then we have some significant results when we compare um, youth who are using the app with youth who are not using the app. Mm -hmm. And then some trending results that I wanted to share, that I will want to share. So we recruited autistic youth between the ages of 13 and 19. We did get some from New York City, Pennsylvania, Delaware, even Ohio. And then we went quite broad after that because we were so, um, we wanted to meet our sample and um, test the app. Um, and so we ended up having participants who were from even further afield than here. Um, we, we, we got those people from Spark, which is an autism database that has thousands and thousands of people in it, autistic people and their, and their families who participate. Um, we had non-speaking English, sorry, um, non-speaking English individuals and those who could not use a computer or smartphone without um, accommodation were, and could not answer the comprehension questions on the consent were excluded from the study. Um, we had 37 youth in this, in this report here, um, sort of somewhat split between male and female, which is great for autism. Usually you have much more male dominated samples. So it's nice that we have that balance here. Um, and we have some distribution across race, but really not enough. <laughs> and we, we don't have a, a very diverse sample, even though our intention was to have that by partnering with New York City Public Schools. But because of COVID, you know, we really didn't get the sample diversity that we were hoping for. for. And the mean average age was 22.2. Um, also likely related to COVID and the fact that school populations were so overburdened by all the COVID pro uh, processes that we were all experiencing. So here um, we had the app users um, in that arm of the experiment to rate the app. Um, and um, they were, ratings were good. Um, app use, we didn't have a, um, we didn't have a reminder to use the app. That was the first thing everybody kept asking us. Like, can you just send me a text or an email to remind me to go on the app? And we did not have that. Um, but despite that, we still got about 50% using the app at least weekly. Um, we used this um, usability systems usability scale and the App average score on this scale is 68, and um, we ended up with a score of 71, which is which is good. Um, we then looked to see we did a what's called a, a goal attainment scaling questionnaire. We had wanted to do it at this higher rigorous level, but because of COVID, we also had to adopt adapt this survey to do um, a less rigorous version of this and it ended up being more like um I would say just goal rating questionnaire is what I would probably consider this to be I know some of you might be familiar those of you if there are in this in the field of autism what the gas is um, but it's very hard to implement without clinical partners who are there with the person and who can assess these goals together with you and it's it's a great outcome measure but hard to implement in the middle of a pandemic um, so when we look at that, we look at the youth who, um, you know, they had to fill out a form about, they, they set a bunch of goals at the beginning, whether they were treatment or control. And then we brought those goals back to them after six weeks of app use. And we asked them to re-rate, you know, what their progress was on all those goals. So these were the results from that. Um, and you can see there's some nice differences, um, for treatment versus control in goal completion. We also looked at, we collected network data from the people in the experiment. We asked them to name all of their network partners and we asked them to um, report. Uh, so that's where we got network size. So they reported their network at time one and then also at the end of the six week period. And you can see some interesting results here for our app users where it looks as if their networks are increasing, which is 
a, that is actually a really nice result. Um, we weren't, we, we, we hoped for that like pie in the sky. And so we're, we were happy to see that um, happening. And then here's something we thought might be more likely, which is this increased closeness. So not only did they say who their network partners were, but how close they were to them. And, and we see here that the um, Trestlers or the app, the app, the youth using the Trestle app had this increased closeness to their network partners and um, increased trust. Now we're, we're um, had some, um, oh, and increased coordination, but some of these are not at significance. And some of them are. Um, all right. And that is the results from the quantitative piece. And we also um, did um, a qualitative study where we invited um, people uh, in the trial and also external to the trial to participate in a, in a qualitative interview about transition and also to share with them the app and get their direct feedback on the app. So with the qualitative data, um, we conducted focus groups or one-on-one -on -one interviews for those who did not want to participate in a focus group. We had eight transition age autistic youth and eight parents um, to participate um, in focus groups. And um, we found, we asked them how Trestle might help with transition. And their main um, comments here are summarized. Um, goal attainment was very important to this group, um, which is nice because this is actually what's important to the district as well. So I, I don't think it's it's not necessarily often that you're the person who the the group or entity that's going to buy the app is has the same kind of commitment or concern as maybe the users who are actually going to use the tool. But in this case, we did have nice alignment between what the district wanted. You know, one of their key outcomes was goal completion and of their transition goals and engagement in their transition goals. And um, it was also a big goal for the youth and for their parents as well. And and um, of course, the district is wanting them to complete their legal IEP goals, but the youth and the parent are wanting to complete all the goals that they put up on the app. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're wanting to complete the same goals, but <laughs> they are interested in goal completion. Um, there is a part of the app that's about training and resources that I actually didn't share with you, but that I, I can go back and share with you in the, in the live demo. The app also has a page where you can easily access with a clip, a click resources. So for example, New York City Public Schools, they shared with us all of their transition resources that they try to get their transition youth and parents to access. And we were able to onboard all of their district resources so that the every single youth that would onboard onto a trestle could click on the links right there in the app. And um, and they could also be, it could also record, you know, the you know, districts love tracking. We all love tracking. In fact, that was one of the biggest things about developing this app was the resisting the um, push by everyone to have more surveillance, more tracking, more um, oversight. And, and um, I think that we, we resisted that by talking about um, self-determination for the youth and the idea that we want the app to be a work in progress, a learning tool. Um, something that the youth can revise and change that it's it's not meant to be an intensive tracking tool that that I are that districts often already have those tools there they're a big part of how they uh, are accountable but we we wanted this alternative tool that was not an accountability tool but that was a learning tool for the youth but also an opportunity for the team to learn together kind of becoming a learning community so we tried to resist that intensive, push towards and drive towards tracking everything, but you can track whether the youth are using their resources. And this was one way that the district got excited about, about that part. Um, the, um, our youth were excited about the app because it was easy to use. It was not noisy. They liked how quiet it was. I don't know if you noticed in the, the demo that it's pretty simply laid out. There's not a lot of bells and whistles on it. It has very direct push points, and we did all of that very, very purposefully. 
Um, so that that aspect of the app was um, appreciated by during the qualitative interviews. And there was um, discussion about its um, helpful motivationally. Um, there were a lot of suggestions for improvement, which would be so exciting. They um, want peer connection, team connection, and mentorship connection <laughs> as must-have features. They want they want the app to be able to connect them to others um, that are doing the app also, creating like trestle communities. Um, they want um, they want more autistic relationship building supports into the app and they want the app to be culturally responsive. So we're still learning what that would mean and how that would be able to be programmed into the app, but that was the second request. And they uh, there were many requests to expand the usability to the minimally verbal population, not just, not just by the school district, which really wants that, but by the parents of, um, of um, non-speaking autistic youth, that there is a lot of coordination that goes on there and a lot of teaming and it's quite burdensome for the caregiver and having a tool that can be uh, accessible and that can cross contexts could be very useful for that population. And we're like on our third grant submission to try and get funding for that, <laughs> not quite yet. Um, and they want more features. They don't uh, that that are feedback um, oriented, and that that we would develop it in tandem with users. You know, where you have that iterative feeling of like, we want this thing, and can you make it happen? <laughs> and like that relationship between the users and the developers, and um, creating you know an emergent sense of like development around that. Um. There were four main qualitative themes that emerged. Um, one was this ecosystem learning community and how this could support that and how important that is for transition. Um, there was um, different parent role tensions that were discussed in, in the qualitative work. And um, this idea of individualized supports that happens across context and this ecosystem advocacy. Those were the four main themes. I'll just touch on them very briefly. Um, just this importance of that learning together how to help a youth, um, an autistic youth, to transition to adulthood. This this was very um, uh, discussed, this, this idea that it's a learning process and that everyone's figuring out how to do it together, um, flying the plane, building the plane while they're flying it. And, and that that's what transition feels like. Um, the parent roles, we had like parents who really wanted more of a supervisory role, others that wanted a buddy role, and then others that wanted that backseat role. So there's variation in what parents want to do um, on this app and with their youth. Um, this is just echoing that idea of individualized supports, not just at school, but everywhere. Um, and that's what makes this coordination so challenging and, and potentially where the app could be helpful is helping to do this individualization um, on a centralized platform. Um, and then this idea of advocacy um, is really just the importance of, of um, just the, the, the constant, I guess the, I'm still thinking about why advocacy is so central and why in these in these um, findings and what its role is with the app. But I think it has to do with this idea that the plot making the plane while you're flying it requires a lot of advocacy and 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 um, if you are you know the people around the youth are are active in that way and the youth is active in that way, then then um, the success is much more likely. And that, you know, that influences also the way that we still, we really push back against using the app as a tracker or as a legal means for making sure districts are doing their job and really emphasizing self-determination. Like that this, this, um, these transitions are so individualized that we really need to support everyone, not just the youth, but everyone around the youth to become a, a kind of advocate. 
so that the transition can be successful. Um, and that I think is it for my presentation and I'm happy to answer questions or ideas, listen to ideas or anything you guys wanna talk about. Thank you so much um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, it's really nice to see this work. I know we've talked about this uh, this work that you've been doing, um, getting ready to develop the app and then you know doing all the work to develop it and now test it you know, over the, over the last um, many years. So yeah, it's really great to see. It's nice to see that, you know, that um, school districts are thinking of ways that they can kind of individualize it so that the, their own resources can be on there and that, um, you know, they can access it directly from there. I'm sure that, that really helps with the kind of sell to the district as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think um, the, the people that join this group and that will watch the video online, I think will be, really interested in knowing more about um, the the um, sort of commercialization of this. I know that's not, um, you know, where you started with this, but I know it's so important to try to, you know, not just develop tools that end up, you know, in the researcher's hand, but to be out there in the community. I know that you feel strongly about that too. Um, so you, you've talked about like, having this be something that the school district will buy so it's not just you know individual like license that someone downloads but the whole district you know has access to it how does that and this is a transition right? so you know that's where they start but that's not where they end up so how do you sort of conceptualize how that would work you know the, the school district buys it, the, the, the individual then is able to use it but then um, I'm sure it's kind of like building better bridges how we'd have to also have the people at the, you know, the other um, life course stage, you know, people that they train um, community programs or employers or wherever they transition to um, also sort of being on the app and being able to use it. So how does that work with like licensing and like, yeah. Um, if you could talk a little bit on that, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have done a lot of thinking about which business model to pursue. And, you know, there are business models where you can have individual payers, maybe through insurance or through Medicare or Medicaid or wherever, like some alternative funding source where um, um, maybe the person, the autistic person qualifies for a certain amount of transition funding that can be used like from a systems level of support, like you know, federal systems that could support the use of an app such as this one. And then we would hire coaches, you know, transition coaches who could come on board and be like our trestle coaches. And they would help, you know, the cost of the coaches and, you know, they could be like Uber drivers, but trestle coaches, you know, where teachers could pick up work after, you know, after their regular school day or um, employee coaches can, can pick up work after their regular school day, make some extra money, do some trestle coaching for a certain number of trestlers or something like this. So we've talked about that as perhaps the most stable model, because then we'd be pulling whoever is important to the youth onto the app and the app would be federally funded right in that in that way now not all autistic people would really have access to that kind of funding um and also i think um there are alternative models that we've been looking at which is more like well if it starts with the district and we build um, a kind of routine and practice for the youth that helps them um as a as like a tool that they use on and off we definitely believe that this app will not be used all the time and that we should target it during critical points of transition, like when the year is just getting started and you have to onboard new people, you dive into the trestle for the first six weeks of school, then you kind of wrap up, maybe you do it in January after you're back from break to reconnect, you know, that you can work on your goals um, you know, on a weekly way, but like really coordinating with that team and, and surging on the app and using the app is going to be an intermittent practice. We think. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the idea would be you 
you grow, you learn with it, you grow with it, you start to use it as a tool to just keep yourself on track for those transition goals um, through your schooling years. And then um, it could become uh, an individual tool, right? That you would somehow we could figure out some way to pay for, right? So some of these school-based apps are charging kind of front ending the costs for this. And they're charging a little bit more for while they're in this school environment to pay somewhat for their after school use, right? Their transition out of school use. So, and then also there could be a reduced price that comes after school. Like you could, um, but you could have a much more affordable tiered pricing system that you could use the app post graduation. So there could be ways to financially think about this. We've also explored how how we would, um, you know, meeting with um, the JCC and meeting with um, CIS, which is a, a community integrated services here in the Philadelphia area. You know, they're they're mandated to and have uh, VR funding to provide supports for youth. So we might be able to get some of this funded through VR. You know, VR is mandated to spend a certain percentage of their funding in high school now that they didn't used to, but now they are. And so there could be a possibility for some VR funding for this, but especially in the post high, high school time, because there's, you know, people who qualify for VR could potentially have this as part of their, their um, coaching infrastructure. So that again is a federal payer. But I think it's complicated and probably the reason why stuff like this hasn't been solved is because there's a lot of moving parts and the business model is not low hanging fruit. I mean, that's everybody's favorite phrase in the business world is like, what's the low hanging fruit? What's the fast and quick way you can make money and get this adopted? And, and um, I just feel grateful to be in an academic context where we don't have to um we don't have to respond to that, like that we can move slower and that we can do better. And I think, you know, I could be wrong, you know, in the end, it might be only the people who move fast who actually <laughs> create products. But um, I just feel grateful now that we can slow our role and try to do this in a way that will create systems change and, and really stick it out and try and figure out what all those rough spots are. And and how to how to smooth them out and and what what those solutions are. Totally, totally agree. Um, okay, so I have a couple of more questions, but do others have questions here? All right. So you talked about the infrastructure for implementation, sort of setting that up from the from the get go, so that it was ready for long term. Um, sustainment. And I know that's something that we had a dedicated meeting a, a while back about thinking that through, what does that actually mean, like in terms of the technology? Um, and yeah, just wanting to know your thought process on that. Like how, how did you think through that? Like what kinds of things did you implement so that it was going to be able to talk to like the schools, um, I don't know, like infrastructure or download the resources or something. Um, like mm -hmm. How do you think that through? Well, um, can we, we have to test it in the district setting, but we have programmed a backend to do this. Now, you know, it needs to be HIPAA and FERPA compliant because that's what districts require. So we've been in the a a Amazon Web Services mm -hmm loud world <laughs> i don't know what we even call those things now but um in that space um they have a hipaa compliance server and we are on that so i mean i do think we're all in emergent settings here like it's not like it can't be hacked so i think um you know these the thing there is this part about you know we're i'm really interested in in making social network what we all know is so valuable about social network social media um, interfaces like twitter and facebook and 
Snapchat and all of these things, like we know they have value, but they also have great harm. Um, and so like, how do you privatize it in a way? Not in a like, let's charge everybody a lot of money to privatize it, but how do we make it safer, a safer neighborhood? How do we create a safer neighborhood for autistic youth to engage in connectivity and, and still make it rich and, and meaningful and useful? Um, so so we, we've been working in that Amazon Web Services environment, um, but we also um, had to create a way to communicate with the district so the district could potentially give us files with PHI, you know, with identified people's names on it. And how would you um, transfer those files securely? Um, Vexel has a solution for that. It's called Liquid Files something or other, right? So we would potentially have these secure ways of inputting all the data we need to set up all the Trestle apps. And then also we've made it so that the district can actually do this, right? So we could get a champion and train them and the district to set this all up. You know, the, the idea would be to have that be independent, that the that the district would pay to use the software and then they would onboard their teams, right? Not us, but still it would be on our app, which is in a HIPAA secure environment. So they don't we don't necessarily need to get those secure files and have an API and all that stuff. Like we they could they could be doing the onboarding and all of that. So mm -hmm. that's part of the solution to that problem. Um, we also didn't host videos and everything on the app. We're doing it through links. So um, they can have links. Um, and if there is um, it, way, links that are, are private, um, then you can make the access to the link be um, restricted to only certain users. So we've been really interested in that. Like, how do you um, protect access by locking away the resources in context that can only be accessed through permissions. Um, so that's been some, an interesting thing we've been thinking about. Um, so those are some of the security um, and safety sort of HIPAA, FERPA considerations, because anytime you're working with a district like this, these things have to be, as I would say, I feel more hopeful now than I did five years ago. Like, Five years ago, Amazon Web Services was getting hacked. <laughs> like, um, I think we're in a little bit better place now than we were back then. And there's more attention to HIPAA FERPA in the business context now. And um, so it does feel a little bit better. We're, we're working in a little bit safer place now. But those are some thoughts about that. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, so I, that, that's great to know where you were sort of where you were thinking, like security and um, and privacy, I was not sure if that's what you had really meant by that, or you're something like something else. But that's that makes a whole lot of sense. Like the school district really wants that to be like, you know, all set in place before they will allow any integration with their with their, with their service. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm interested in in how to solve these problems without doing the integration. Like everyone's always about like, how are you going to do the API? What does the API look like? How's it? I'm like, well, what if they just onboarded people onto this AWS secure, <laughs> secure environment? And then, you know, but I don't know. It's interesting. It's, uh, it's, um, there are traditional solutions, solutions that are being used for apps that I'm not necessarily sure they're always needed, like in that way, like there could be uh, alternatives. I guess it just depends on what, what they require, right? So, uh, yep. so Karen has a question. I know you're working on the feedback. Um, are you planning to include more languages to make it more accessible? Um, or will it happen further down the line when you're working through the feedback? Yeah, the districts made it very clear that they want translation. So we've been working with our app developer and he's giving us two choices. One choice is the cheap choice. It's like Google Translate. They can use Google Translate on the app and then we all know what that looks like because we're all 
more or less using it when we're on Zoom or watching our words being Google translated um, or whatever it is. I don't know what Zoom uses, but there is translation right now that you can put in for a fairly low cost. Um, but if we go that other route where we have like quality translation, my sister used to work at a um, a startup that is now, you know, a full-fledged business where they do translations for all websites and businesses and all of that into different languages and they curate content. And I can tell you that it's very, very expensive. But it's um, very desirable for districts. They really want it. And so, you know, it's just a moderate. I think that it it it's just they won't pay for it is the problem. I don't think they want it, but I don't think they can afford it. Yeah, it's um, it's hard to do this work well, right? You have to really make sure that you have the appropriate amounts of funding, which can be challenging in you know this kind of um, research environment that we have now. Yes, I see we're at time. I want to thank you again, um, Dr. Hastrick, for coming to talk to us um, about your work, and thank you very, very much for sharing um all that you've shared. Um, this will be our last meeting for the academic year. Um, so we'll start again in September. I'm going to be sending out a um, a survey to get feedback about um, the group and directions for the next academic year. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hastrick, again. Um, and I'll be in touch at the end of the summer. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. So Bye.